probably a lecture that early in the morning. Um, I have to confess I'm not that creative in the morning, especially if two kids keep you awake until midnight. And then you still have to do all the cleaning, prepare everything, wake up at six, do all the traffic to, to, to be here in time. Um, but I'll, I'll manage something, something hopefully interesting for you. Um, corruption, it's obviously not the issue that you would be like to talk uh, at breakfast. Um, it's the kind of issue that turns our guts around and uh, uh, we are um, quite sensitive about it. Um, it's an age-old phenomenon. It's as old as government itself. And uh, this is precisely the, the departure point of, uh, of my presentation. This is a um, picture, um, representation of good government by Ambrogio Lorenzetti in the uh, Palazzo Pubblico in Siena. And it's a series of pictures of good and bad government and the consequences of good and bad government. The classics look at corruption as a decay of the body politic. And some authors, Machiavelli and others, look at the corruption as a process that lead to regime decay and regime transition in a cyclical way. So, you know, princedoms, which are very authoritative, uh, which would be probably compared to today's authoritarian regimes or uh, restricted democracies, uh, they too suffer from corruption and they too would reach a stage in which uh, the system could no longer provide for the well-being of its individuals and then decay and then republics would come in which are more, you know, more liberal, more uh, open to, to, to protect the rights of people, promote the rights of people. But it would suffer from the same issue, you know. After a while, uh, power gets um, ingrained in, in, in abuses, abuses of office, and it becomes quite, quite repeated, systemic, and eventually it would also lead to collapse. Now, associated with good government, as you can see, there's two monarchs there being counseled by divine providence. Of course, you have to contextualize these pictures. We're talking about uh, early... Uh, um, Renaissance period, so you 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 start having the the some consideration about you know, human aspects and, and the principles underlying good government being discussed uh, by by some authors. Um, the set of values that we associate with good government haven't changed that much. And if, we, if, if you look on top of uh, uh, all these ladies sitting next to the monarch, uh, there are uh, principles, standards uh, of good government which are identified in this picture. You can't read properly because it, it, it's there. You know? just, just in case when you go to Siena you can see this in detail. Justice, moderation, solidarity. Okay, probably with different names, slightly different, because some of these concepts I'm adapting to uh, the, the modern jargon. Prudence, honesty, peace. The consequences of good government, and by the way, feel free to interact. This is not just a talk, it's a chat, so it's all in the morning, so if you want to add up, uh, feel free to stop and ask for clarifications if you want. The consequences of good government would be a wealthy society where everybody is working. You know, you have people producing arts there, you have people uh, doing other activities all in a cordial way, people talking, people happy, dancing. You know, everybody's happy. Good government produces um, a social context of prosperity. When it comes to bad government, and believe me, this picture has been repeated time after time when Mr. Berlusconi was in office in Italy, uh, for the simple reason that the lady that you see being thrashed uh, at the feet of the tyrant um, uh, in, in pretty bad shape, I mean, she's changed, she's humiliated, it's justice, justitia, and that's you know, that's the, 
the, the, I think the underlying message of pipe government. Justice being humiliated at the feet of political power. And then again, you have political power being counseled uh, uh, by the devil. You can see the, uh, the horns there and the, the beasts. And there's also a series of principles associated with bad law, precisely the opposite of what you get for good government. So injustice, cruelty, tyranny, um, conflict, arrogance, and of course war. I mean, if uh, the consequence of good government is prosperity, the consequence of bad government, it will end up in social conflict, and there's a few other pictures which I've not included, but it's a long... Uh, um, and some of them, as you can see, are already missing, parts are missing. Uh, it's people working in the fields for good government. You see you know, people doing their activities in a normal way. For bad government, you see houses burning, uh, wars, uh, etc. So this frames pretty much what we'll discuss about uh, corruption today. But before I move forward, and not to make this too abstract, because you're saying, okay, he's talking about corruption in terms of regime decay, but uh, I thought corruption was about quid pro quo. You know, I want a decision, and I bribe a public official to get um, um, a favorable decision on a public procurement or a license or whatever. And uh, yeah, we, we, we also have that, and as again, as I said, corruption is as old as government, so when we created state, the prince delegated three basic functions at the outset. That's the capacity to provide for justice, of course the laws that the, the prince, the sovereign, would dictate, and the capacity to extract rents from the citizens' taxes in order to pay for their security and eventually some works. That's how the, the state works. So the, the prince entrusted to an agent, a sheriff, a judge, to do this job for him. The problem is, how can you trust someone that you don't know too well? And maybe this guy, you know, like it happens in the Robin Hood uh, uh, tale, he starts uh, cheating and stealing for himself. So he's not uh, responding to the objectives of the principle and is certainly putting a high cost on the, 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 the citizen. But you have two judges. It's a, um, an allegory that you can see. It's a fresco in uh, uh, Passos Audience in Montserrat, in Alentejo. Beautiful site, beautiful town, if you want to go there. And uh, again, from the 15th century, it's a little bit uh, later than the Ambrosio Lorenzetti's uh, frescoes, and you have a representation of the good and bad judge. Uh, you, can you identify which one is good and which one is bad? Right Anyone? On the, right. the bad being on the right, yes, on my left, and uh, the good, and, and why is that? Ah, good one. Yeah, I wouldn't start from there, but that's that's a good point. Yes. Yeah. What else? And you have the angels. You have the angels. You have uh, divine providence crowning a good decision of a judge. And in the other side, what what do you have there? You're kneeling. You're kneeling uh, uh, before the, the judge. There are people around him. Yeah, they're not really, really kneeling. Can we see kneeling? Yeah, but... One is looking in the eyes and the other Very good. This one looking front. But this one, it's not just looking sideways. There's double face. Double face. Plus... Who is that? In the corner. A bit hard to, 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 to see because the, the picture, I mean, but that's as good as I can get. Um, it's the devil. It's the devil that is counseling the, the judge. And yes, we have a guy that is injured here and is getting a good decision. Everything is taken according to the books, uh, by the books. And here we have these two guys 
and the judge cannot decide that this moving is set as double phase justice, double standard justice. And if you can notice these two guys, one of them has got something in his hands here. Actually, it's birds, but yeah, you can look fish from there. It's birds, and it's partridges, eh? or these. Why? Because partridges are identified, if you still remember, out to the barca do inferno, uh, identified as a delicatessen at that time. I mean, if you know some basics of hunting, I don't hunt, I preserve animals. But I grew up in a region where people hunt, and if you listen to hunters, they will always say partridges are difficult to hunt. So they are exquisite and delicatessen. So they're a very rich prize to give. You know, it's probably like giving a beluga caviar to a public official nowadays. Um, and here you have the other guy is putting his hand in his pocket and pulling some coins. So basically what we're saying is that bribery can be done either by material or non-material inducements. Okay? You can bribe someone uh, by offering a trip to Brazil or by offering um, sex. It happens a lot. Uh, or, you know, by giving an envelope La bustarella, as the Italians would say, with money. So, as you can see, nothing new. Uh, old wine in new bottles. And uh, what has changed? Well, the focus of corruption has slightly changed from bureaucratic into a political corruption and market corruption nowadays. Even from a legal standpoint, there has been an evolution of legislation, special laws on uh, criminal offenses that have moved from the traditional uh, definition that corruption is the abuse of office for private regards by a public official that uh, seeks to extract rents from discretionary power so we could easily define corruption with a simple formula which would be corruption equals monopoly of power plus discretion to interpret norms minus accountability and transparency. So in a context where accountability standards are pretty lame or not sufficiently developed, where checks and balances are not really robust and the guy is left to his own pretty much, and where transparency, we cannot see through the decision-making process, in such a context, if you have a public official that has a lot of decisional capacity and uh, a lot of discretion in interpreting the norms, there is a high risk for corruption. It's not saying that he will be corrupt by definition, thank God. Uh, but there is a, a risk, the conditions are there. But we moved a little bit from that to uh, back to the classical, that's why I started with the classical way of looking at corruption as the decay of government, because nowadays this is what is shocking people. It's not just that the bureaucrat charged with public procurement tasks that is putting some money in the pocket, uh, when he's buying uh, petrol for the company's car or, or when he's buying some um, computers for the office. It's about decision making, uh, it's about the perversion uh, of uh, or the degeneration of a democratic culture of accountability, of transparency and this continuous bashing of elites and institutions, representative institutions, on a daily basis by the press, by the detection of another scandal which involves members of parliament or um, you know, secretaries of state or parties um, linked to illicit financing. The, um, the fact that we have 
uh, uh, all these um, actors, institutions, and processes, um, in a way, pervert, perverted from their natural condition. I, I keep telling this to my students of, of political science um, that, and, and I had this discussion with colleagues in a, in a major political science conference at, at, at the European level when we were discussing the future of political science. I said, yeah, the, 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 the future is not looking bright for our uh, field. Uh, one of the reasons is that if you look at, uh, at the surveys that we've been carrying out in the last two decades, you have um, actors that nobody likes. Nobody likes most, most democracies. People, you know, politicians rank very low. You have institutions that nobody trusts. If you put parliament and government, it will be down at the bottom of the league. And you have processes of decision making that the majority of people no longer understand. How come it takes so long to get uh, a decision, um, especially when we're talking about interrelated tiers of government at the European level? Now, it's, uh, it's, so it's, it's worrisome for someone who studies politics to say our, you know, our core uh, um, actors, institutions and processes are, um, are, are in bad shape. Um, so more and more you have very few references, uh, very few references left of uh, mm, uh, what a naturally sound condition of politics is. So you, you, you know more or less what is corruption, you react to this, you feel very disgusted about uh, things that are reported to the press, but if I ask you, so tell me, what is your idea? of what democracy should be. And, you know, it takes a bit to think, you know, what kind of institutions should I... You know, because this one has already had a scandal and that one has already had a scandal. You know, you start losing these references um, of what could be a naturally sound condition of politics. Let's look at some data from a Portuguese survey we carried out in 2006 prior to the crisis. 69.7 of the people, so nearly 70% of the Portuguese. This is a representative sample. It was a face-to-face -face survey, so all the uh, rigor in terms of methods of sampling, etc., are there. Believe that corruption is what the law says to be corruption. So you look at the penal code, there's a definition there, you look at the uh, crime law, there's a definition there for political uh, officials, and that's it. This is corruption. Well, it's a fact that, uh, you know, societies criminalize certain kind of practice or conduct that they feel there is a broad consensus in the society that these are uh, wrong uh, or deviant. Uh, conduct. However, um, corruption is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain, which is more or less the definition that we, you will read in a penal code. It's, uh, it's not sufficient. Why? Because, um, you know, um, not every conduct uh, that is um, not prescribed by law, it's not prohibited by law, is ethically acceptable for public opinion. And more and more you have this discrepancy between legal norms and social norms. So corruption as a phenomenon is defined and it's, it's, the boundaries are these two sets of standards. On the one hand we have very rigid, uh, very reactive, very conservative, set of standards which are legal formal, you know, laws, although in Portugal they change quite frequently, but they don't change every day, penal codes don't change every day, the definitions take a long time to, 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 to change in the penal codes. Um, these are the, the, uh, the legal formal standards. And then you have um, corruption in the eyes of the people. 
you know, what people believe to be social norms. And there it's like a chameleon. It changes because if I go around the table and throw a couple of scenarios, some people will say, yes, I think this is corruption, and others probably will say, no, I don't think I think it's politics as usual. So the second dimension is the social norm. And here you have less, around 52% of the people, saying that you know, corruption is what the majority of people says it's corruption. That's easy for me. I mean, that clarifies some issues uh, which are in the gray in the gray zone. And so you see the social norm, you know, you all dressing the same, going the same direction, you join the gang. Now it, it was interesting because there were other dimensions of the social definition of corruption that we explored and were very interesting to understand how people react to corrupt politicians in office. Do they vote the rascals out when they identify that there's a mayor who's being you know, involved in corruption or there's a minister who's being involved in corruption? What do I do? Do I still vote for them? And 56.2% of the interviewed said, if corruption is for a good cause, then it is not corruption. That's pretty much the Robin Hood style of corruption, you know? Um, and we've had that time and after time, not just in Portugal. I, I remember Craxi, which was the leader of the Socialist Party in Italy, minor party, but managed always to have a coalition with the Christian Democrats, and Craxi had to exile in Ben Ali's Tunisia, which, as you know, it was the starting point of the Arab Spring, uh, because it was so corrupt. Uh, he actually he said he exiled in Tunisia. There's no um, um, uh, exiling in democracy in, the, in, in that sense that he ran away from justice, that's to put it simple. But when he was in the court and they asked about the scheme that they had framed about illicit financing of parties, and there was kind of a lotizzazione, it was like you know, we get rents from public procurement, from uh, public construction, it could be a highway, it could be a metro uh, line, whatever, a new airport. Um, they would extract rents and they would share the rents to the various parties, <laughs> according to their electoral way, more or less. So this, um, when he's confronted with the evidence, he says, yes, I did it but I did it for the good of democracy. Because democracy cannot work without money. You need money to run elections, to present programs, to communicate with the people, and I did it for the good of democracy. He didn't convince the Italians, and he had to flee to uh, Tunisia. Um, then we had 63.6 of the population said, if the benefits, if, 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 the, the, if corruption produces positive externalities to the population, so what? It's not corruption. I mean, if the guy gets bribes from public procurement, but uses those 5% he gets uh, of illicit commissions to build a kindergarten, is there anything wrong with this? Um, yet for 63.6 of the population, there's nothing wrong. So the culture of the uh, famous Brazilian politician, Aldemar, that had this massive slogan saying, I steal, but I can deliver. Um, it, 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 it has been echoed time and after time when we had these reports about certain mayors, including uh, in the outskirts of Lisbon. Um, so the, I won't go too much into this because there's, there's, there's more stuff to come. And this is quite a bit of theoretical, just to say that there's a series of ways of trying to understand the complexity of this phenomenon. And of course, typologies are simplifications of, of, um, of these different perspectives, different types of corruption which can be identified. And just to sum up, if we look at in terms of frequency and intensity, perhaps we could come with not so perfect grid of four major types. 
One, it's uh, what we already discussed, it's the quid pro quo corruption, which is low in resources. And uh, for the majority of Western European countries, still pretty low. When we ask in the surveys um, how many people in the last 12 months or the last three years have been asked a bribe or have paid a bribe, we're talking about 2%, 3% of the respondents. You say, oh, they lied in the survey. It's not really, it doesn't really work like that. Still, when you look at the reports in the um, investigative authorities, the, the percentage is, is not that big either. So it's not so much that kind of corruption, it's another kind of corruption that is troubling people. It's more the systemic type, it's more the political type. Then you have a structural cultural corruption which pretty much everybody does. From the minister to my mother, uh, everybody does, including myself probably, uh, which is this pulling strings, getting things fixed, you know? It's uh, what the Italians say, l'arte de la you know, the, the, if in Portuguese we have the same expression, uh, art do zen rescanso. Uh, so that's um, that kind of um, corruption, which is very widespread, but very low in resources. It relies mostly on your social capital. That is on the contacts you have on your cell phone. You know, if you need something, you call someone uh, who, get, who, who is able to... Um, help you. In fact, it, it's funny because there was another, another uh, uh, survey at the European level, it's called the European Social Survey, um, back in the mid-2005, um, if I'm not aware, so about the same time as this one uh, that I showed you earlier. And Portugal, as well as Spain, although Portugal in a better position than Spain, <laughs> better, um, they stood out as a cluster in terms of negative social capital. If you want to read more about it, there's a publication on this issue. Um, you know, capital you can use to ask for a service or a benefit you're not entitled to. So you're already asking someone to uh, go beyond his prerogatives to favor you. And, and Portugal came on top, and second place, Spain. Then you have systemic or political institutional corruption, um, which is becoming um, more and more um, widespread. It's not just issues of conflicts of interest, it's also illicit financing. Um, and a transsystemic or white collar corruption, which uh, I was um, talking earlier uh, with uh, uh, one of the members, the public. The, Corruption that uh, our companies, for instance, uh, engage in international business transactions. It's not the kind of corruption that every uh, company is uh, uh, engaging in because it certainly needs certain capacity, certain resources, business outside the country, etc. So um, that's, I would say, more or less four types of, of, of corruption that we can identify. Now, what causes it? In a way, we've been discussing some of these problems. Levels of development. Um, you know, to think that corruption just happens in countries that are underdeveloped, it's like the chicken and egg dilemma. What comes first? You know, it's corruption that's leading to lack of development, or it's the lack of development that it's leading to more corruption. And you have several studies, we can't come to a concrete causal relation because in fact we have periods of history where there's been economic growth coupled with massive corruption and nobody cares. Nobody cares. It's what we say when the, when the cow is fat, nobody bothers because you can milk it as much as you want. But when the cow is thin, you know, and milk is missing, then you start saying someone is drinking more than I am, and you get uh, concerned about the way resources are spent. So yeah, the reconstruction of Europe was piled with corruption, yet nobody bothered. There were other bigger issues. For Christ's sake, they, we just had come out of two consecutive world wars in European territory. You know, Europe was in a total chaos, completely destroyed, 
we had to rebuild it, so corruption was not a priority. Although, it was massive opportunities there. Um, so, uh, be aware of this. Um, be aware, of course, of what we discussed nowadays about legal corruption, the, the perversion of regulatory and decision-making and legislative process, which also happen in uh, most developed countries. But is it the result of a dominant civic culture, which is more um, relativist with regards to standards, which is more particularistic? Uh, yes, I mean, there's um, a lot of discussion about this, in, including studies to see whether certain kinds of dominant religion uh, may have an influence. And some studies point that, you know, religions which are more hierarchical, um, that have this, uh, that, that depend on this uh, uh, mechanism of uh, releasing guilt by confessing, which is the case of Catholic, uh, um, of, of Catholicism, uh, you know, you, you, you confess, then you, you're okay. You're at peace with yourself, you know. You, um, that kind of um, moral standards might influence uh, also certain predispositions to tolerate corruption. There's some research on this, and again, uh, uh, most of this, um, uh, uh, most of this research is based on surveys, and they, they tend to be quite inconclusive. You know, you have one study that says yes, and then two years later comes another set of uh, academics saying, no, you got it wrong. But that's how we're progressing. We, we're finding some uh, causal relations here and there. It's not easy. And one of the reasons why it's not easy, it's because we don't have a, a broad consensus of what corruption means. One, so there's a conceptual issue a priori. And second, since there is a problem of definition, there's also a problem of measurement. And how can we measure? Well, am I going to get crime statistics in different countries and see which one has more corruption? No, oh, no, 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 stop, stop, because that's the wrong way. You may have a country that has a more effective judiciary than another, so if they have higher statistics, it's not because they have more corruption, it's because their judiciary is better in detecting and sanctioning this phenomenon. You might have one which is packed with corruption, and yet nobody moves. Nobody blinks. So, um, yeah, crime statistics are not very good to measure. The alternative, which has been suggested by two academics who worked with Transparency International, was to use the social cultural standards, i.e. using surveys to ask people how much corruption do you think there is in your country compared to others, and then eventually you arrive at certain kind of proxy measurement. Uh, just a quick question, because it's so common that every year uh, the results of that survey uh, uh, come out, and the media always presents it as the level of corruption instead of presenting it as the perception. The level of level perceived of, corruption. Yeah, yes. so how, and, and, and sometimes you get some, art, uh, so, uh, some other sources of data and you see that the perception level, is a, there's a mismatch between the measurable uh, uh, yeah. corruption level. So we have to see what, does ex, what explains that, that mismatch and what are the, 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 the cons of trying to measure perception, measure corruption through perception? Yeah, as I said, I mean, there's no perfect solution for that because uh, the measuring of, uh, objectively measuring corruption uh, as an offense, it's, uh, it's the problem of the tip of the iceberg. We never know uh, whether what we're looking in terms of statistics, it's just the tip of the iceberg and you know, in terms of physics, what does it mean, the tip of the iceberg? The tip of the iceberg is just always uh, the marginal part of a big problem that is under the surface and has not been unveiled, has not been detected by the authorities. So that's an issue. Another issue is also that even in criminal standards, although there's been a lot of conventions, international conventions, including the United Nations, has passed huge convention in 2005, the ANCAC, um, there's been a, uh, um, a tendency for 
harmonizing uh, legal definitions of corruption and still from country to country you have specificities. Just to give you a, a, a very uh, a small example, in the case of Portugal, corruption is defined as a crime against the, the state interest, the Fazenda Pública. Um, whereas in uh, and the crime of traffic of influence is considered a crime against the uh, realization of the state of justice in the case of france corruption and traffic of influence are together in the same part of the world you may think this is minor it's not minor when it comes to law enforcers because the way you codify these crimes and the way you say there is a relation between both or not, it will have consequences on the investigation. Now, you're absolutely right, it's a, a proxy. Um, there's a lot of talk internally in Transparency International about the usefulness of CPI uh, because things, in, in any case, things won't change from night to day. Um, you, you have some countries who have been doing well, who have improved in the ranking thanks to a series of reforms they've carried out. Um, so that, that gives a positive message that says you can change. Uh, probably it will, it will take a while because uh, this is not just about perceptions, it's about stereotypes as well. And stereotypes are very difficult to overcome. You know, they're, they're sticking labels. They stick mistake and as much as you you know I already did these reforms I brought experts they told me to do this and that and that and still I see no improvements in the league of uh, more corrupt and least corrupt countries a lot, of, a lot of governments writing to Transparency International saying come on I mean we're doing the stuff and we're not moving we're not improving I mean you can't Forced these uh, the opinions of uh, businessmen on, and then some of these opinions are <coughs> stereotyped. But can you move out from this uh, from this uh, break from this from this situation? Yeah, there, there there are some countries who have, for instance, Cape Verde. Uh, and 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 the funny thing is that countries who have done successfully, they've not just done successful through anti-corruption reforms. No, they've done successfully through major structural reforms in their administration. The same, for instance, with Georgia. Yeah, Georgia is packed with high-level corruption, cronies, it's a crony regime. Still, when you enter the country and you go to the customs or the tax office, things work and you have this confidence. And if you are a businessman, and this is the sample they use for constructing the corruption perception index, then your perception will be constructed based on the relations you have with the three or four core institutions you deal with as a businessman, which means tax office, maybe local authority because you want to open the, the factory or the company and you need to interact with the local authority, uh, customs because you need to import the materials, etc. If these are working well, you already improve your image. And then, of course, there's that much you can do in terms of communication. Uh, I still remember flying with Lufthansa, and you open the magazine of Lufthansa, and here it comes, big uh, advertisement of come to Georgia for business. We're improving our ranking in the Corruption Perception Index. But they were improving. It's a fact. Oh, quality of institutions. I think this is, I think, the, the, it's a, a resilient problem and uh, quality of laws, quality of institutions. And definitely that, that uh, explains a series of conducts in terms of civic culture. You know, people don't just pull strings because they, you know, they feel it's the coolest way to get things done. Now, if you have an administration of, uh, that is functioning well and that it's not abusive to, to your rights, um, that you know clearly that if you match these requirements, you will get the service, you will get the benefit, then there's no need of contacting people to do you a favor or bribing people. You know, things work properly. So some of the uh, this negative civic culture is bred by bad corruptions, 
and bad regulations. Why do we worry about corruption? Well, one of the reasons is because it hinders development. You can look at here using the Corruption Perception Index and uh, GDP. Um, you can see that there is a uh, um, um, direct correlation between both. So uh, the higher, the richer you are, uh, um, the, the cleaner you are, the, the, the more prosperous you are, and vice versa. As I said, I'm not overconfident on this for the various reason I told you. In historical terms, you had periods of uh, a, a fast economic growth um, in which there was piles of corruption and yet it, it, it people and governments didn't really bother about it. Um, and, and you have investors, private investors, which are risk takers. You know, they prefer, oh, don't go there because, you know, in order for you to, to, to start your uh, business, you have to pay this guy, you have to pay that guy, you have to pay... I take the risk because the market is good. I have a product that can be easily uh, get uh, 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 a good position in that market, and I take the risk. So the, it's unconclusive, but I, I, I throw it as um, um, uh, I pitch to you this, this thing, whether it, it, it greases or sands the system. Now, in terms of petty corruption, the quid pro quo thing, um, uh, quid pro quo bribery, yeah, it, it works like a, a, um, a reverse tax, in the sense that what we, the information we get from the surveys, and this is not business survey, this is uh, uh, surveys to samples of the population, so Transparency International has these two um, major surveys. One is the CPI, which launches annually, measures the least and most corrupt countries. I'll, I'll come to it in a moment. And the other is the Global Corruption Barometer, which is based on surveys at the national level. As you can see, in grey is the lower income quintile, which means corruption, quid pro quo corruption, is heavier on those people who don't have sufficient social capital to get on the phone, phone a, a friend and ask for a favor. So they have to pay for it if you are in that condition. If you look at the global corruption barometer, as we said earlier, democratic societies are a complex set of rules, institutions, actors, and the ones that are central to democracy are not doing well. As you can see, political parties on top, and then police mostly on those countries that are going through transition or still have a sort of authoritarian outlook. Uh, the global picture in terms of the ranking, the CPI rank, the, the uh, uh, ranking of perceptions of corruption, um, two in three countries in the world score below 50. Scoring below 50 is bad. I mean, you have they're highly corrupt from 0 to 100, clean 50 is halfway. So you have uh, halfway of the countries in the G20 scoring less than 50. And you have 100% of the BRICS scoring less than 50. You have more than 6 billion people living in countries that score below 50. So a lot of people living in countries that have to live on a daily basis with corruption. Corruption quid pro quo. What measures have been taken, um, and I'm right going to the conclusion now. Um, well, the idea is to make corruption high risk and low return. That's the idea. So a lot of this work, um, fighting corruption is not about um, um, silver bullet, you know, there's no panacea. It's a um, cocktail of measures, some of them structural. Uh, for instance, you dematerialize administrative process. You make them digital, you put digital platforms, you reduce the human factor, the, the, the discretionary action. You say, does that solve the problem? Not necessarily, you might scale up corruption, because you still have the problem of who guards the guardians, who guards the guy who has the key access to the system. But, you know, still it uh, uh, changes. Or, for instance, you have high corruption in the public sector, in public companies. Okay, if you 
get rid of some of these companies, you get rid of a patronage system that is parties filling in the top positions of these companies and extracting rents out of this for financing their own uh, campaigns or for uh, illicit enrichment. So you can have a series of other measures other than specific changes to the penal code or criminal laws or law on party financing or law on conflict of interest regulation. And you have more or less these four elements. Uh, managerial changes in terms of public service conditions uh, is the pay good? You don't need to seek for additional rents. Uh, is your work conditions good? And uh, the coordination body, I mean, you have um, sort of collegial um, uh, uh, um, management, uh, codes of conduct, um, professionalization. A lot of people, in both in companies as in the public sector, do not know what a conflict of interest is. Sometimes they face a conflict of interest and they do not know how to manage that conflict of interest. I can give you piles of examples on this. Uh, leadership commitment, of course, important. And as you can see from outside the organization, public involvement and scrutiny are also crucial. At the international level, this is more or less what's happening. It's between the domestic and the international level that everything in terms of setting norms of anti-corruption are um, either through conditionality, the Copenhagen Agreement, there's no member state candidate country to the EU that is not asked to have an anti-corruption policy and to do work in this, in this field. Uh, the IMF and the World Bank in terms of borrowing conditionality, then you have civil society organizations such as TI, you have an epistemic community, what's called the anti-corruption industry, also puts a lot of pressure on this, and uh, other international organizations such as the Council of Europe, the OECD, etc. What can I do as a citizen? You can report, you can join an anti-corruption NGO like uh, Transparency International, and I hope, sincerely hope that you join TI Portugal. Um, we need needing good activists and people also available to help us with internal governance. You can engage in street protest against corruption as being piled in several countries. In Manila, uh, against the Marcos regime, that was uh, where some of these uh, protests uh, had its kickoff. Not buying from corrupt companies, mobilizing people, signing petition, voting the rascals out. I mean, the guy is corrupt. I'm not voting this guy. Um, but when you actually look at the data, people are well-intentioned to make this change. Whether they will make it in practice, it's another matter. People are well-intentioned to report. A lot of 70% of the people said they would blow the whistle if they saw corruption. Yet, when we asked, what about those 30% who said they wouldn't? What are the problems? And I said, well, there's three main reasons why I don't do it. Because I fear reprisals. I think that nothing will be done about it, and I don't like to snitch on others. Now, two of these, these two surveys that were carried out in Portugal and France, so you can see the difference. Two of these are very interesting because these two, it's about report mechanisms, institutional mechanisms that safeguard whistleblowers, which are underdeveloped in a lot of countries, including Portugal and France. Not a snitcher is more of a cultural problem coming to the civic culture. 300 years of inquisition of denouncing thy neighbor for not eating pork, for being Jew, for being Muslim. 48 years of dictatorship denouncing thy neighbor for being a, a rebel, for being a communist for being a socialist. You know, it's not easy to change from one day to the next, this culture. A lot of people confuse the snitching with whistleblowing. They're two different things. One, it's one form of collaboration with justice. The other is a duty, in fact. Thanks for your attention.